This lecture is the second part of our unit on family violence and will deal with child and elder abuse. As many as one in four American children will experience some form of abuse or mistreatment during their childhood, according to the CDC. 78% will be victims of neglect, 18% will be victims of physical abuse, 9% will be victims of sexual abuse, and 11% will be victims of other kinds of maltreatment. In 2012, U.S. CPS, or Child Protective Services Agencies, received 3.4 million reports of child abuse or neglect. Some of those CDC referrals were for non-serious issues, but annually it's estimated that about 1,640 children will die from child maltreatment. Of perpetrators of child abuse, a small majority, 52.6%, will be women. This is probably because in our culture, as well as many others, women still retain primary responsibility for the day-to-day -day care of infants and young children. About 80.1% of perpetrators are parents of the victim. About 90% of those will be biological parents, 4.4% will be step-parents, and less than 1% will be adoptive parents. Child abuse that results in fatalities shows a different kind of gendered pattern. Male parents and caregivers tend to be most likely to be responsible for fatalities due to physical abuse, whereas female parents and caregivers are more likely to be responsible for fatalities due to neglect. Child abuse and neglect is more common in low-income families and single-parent families, and the risk of fatality and severe injury is highest during infancy. Infants are likely to be at highest risk for severe injury or fatality for a number of reasons, including their physical frailty and vulnerability, the fact that they require more care, and the fact that their care presents special challenges. For this reason, over the past several decades, clinicians, doctors, social workers, and other experts in child development have worked to bring public awareness to the problem of shaken baby syndrome, or what is also sometimes called abusive head trauma, or AHT. Abusive head trauma occurs by direct blows to the head, by dropping or throwing a child, or, commonly, by shaking a child. It is the leading cause of death in child abuse cases in the United States. The average age of victims of shaken baby syndrome or abusive head trauma are between three and eight months of age, with peak risk being between two weeks old and two months old, which is a time period when babies tend to cry the most. The perpetrators in about 70% of cases of death caused by shaken baby syndrome or abusive head trauma are male, usually either the baby's father or a mother's boyfriend or perhaps a stepfather. Often, the perpetrator is someone in his early 20s. When someone forcibly shakes a baby, the child's head rotates uncontrollably. This is because infants' neck muscles aren't well developed and strong enough to, to provide support for their heads. This violent movement pitches the infant's brain back and forth within the skull, sometimes rupturing blood vessels and nerves, causing shearing damage throughout the brain or tearing the brain tissue. The brain may also strike the inside of the skull, causing brooding, bleeding, and bruising. One common risk factor for abusers in these cases, and for child abuse cases in general, is that they tend to have a poor understanding of normal childhood development, and often poor emotion management or anger management skills on top of that. The lack of understanding of child development makes them interpret a child or infant's behavior as defiant or aggressive, as them deliberately disobeying, rather than understanding that certain kinds of behavior among small children are normal features of child development. Recently, members of the health, pro health professions have begun working to educate new parents about a normal stage of infant development called the period of purple crying. This stage of development begins at about two weeks of age, usually peaks in the second month, and continues until about three to four months of age. There are other common characteristics of this phase, or period, which are described by the acronym PURPLE. PURPLE, P, peak of crying, meaning that crying tends to start around two weeks of age, intensify in the second month, and then begin to wane thereafter. U, it's unexpected. The crying can come and go, and you don't know why. R, it resists soothing. 
The baby may not stop crying no matter what you try. P. There's a pain-like face. A crying baby may look like they are in pain even when they're not. L. It's long-lasting. The crying can last as long as five hours a day or more. And E. Evening. The baby may tend to cry more in the late afternoon and evening. It's thought that almost all babies go through this normal period of infant development. We don't know why they do it, but it seems to be common for most of them. Some will cry more, and some will cry a lot less. What's important for parents to understand and be educated about is that the word period means that the crying has a beginning and an end. The stage is frustrating and frightening for parents, but it does pass that the majority of cases of death or severe injury by shaken baby syndrome or abusive head trauma happen during the period of purple crying indicates that at least some of these injuries, probably many of them, are driven at least in part by caregiver frustration and also lack of awareness or understanding. If we are unusually vulnerable to abuse at the beginning of our lives, we return to the state of heightened vulnerability at the end of it. Americans are living longer into old age than ever before, and that is mostly a good thing. But it also means that many of us will spend some portion of the last years of our lives dependent on the care of others. With that dependence comes a renewed risk of mistreatment. Approximately 7 to 10 percent of elderly people will experience or ab abuse or neglect. This is actually higher when categories of abuse, such as financial abuse or exploitation, are measured. 90% of perpetrators will be family members or partners of the victim. 52% of perpetrators are male. The abuse of elderly people can fall into several categories. Physical abuse, inflicting physical pain or injury on a senior person by slapping them, bruising them, or restraining them physically. Sexual abuse, non-consensual sexual contact of any kind. Neglect. The failure by those responsible to provide food, shelter, health care, or protection for a vulnerable person. Exploitation or financial abuse. The illegal taking, misuse, or concealment of funds, property, or assets of a senior for someone else's benefit. This kind of abuse is often perpetrated by non-family members as scams targeting the elderly. Emotional abuse, inflicting mental pain, anguish, or stress on an elderly person through verbal or nonverbal acts. For example, humiliating, intimidating, or threatening them. And finally, self-neglect or abandonment basically refers to the desertion of a vulnerable elder person by anyone who has assumed the responsibility for care or custody of that person. Self-neglect is characterized as the failure of a person to perform essential self-care tasks that might threaten his or her own health or safety. Self-neglect is often accompanied by abandonment when someone who can't really care for themselves is left alone to do so. Female elders are more likely to be the victims of all categories of abuse except for abandonment. While making up about 58% of the total national elderly population, women were the victims in about 76.3% of emotional or psych psychological abuse cases, the victims in about 71% of physical abuse cases, about 63% of the victims of financial or material exploitation cases, and the victims in about 60% of neglect cases, which is the most frequent type of maltreatment. A majority of the victims of abandonment were men, about 62.2%. The more frail or cognitively impaired an elderly person is, the more at risk for abuse they are. Disabled people of any age are at higher risk for most kinds of abuse, including physical, sexual, and emotional abuse, with the 2012 study placing the risk between 50 to 60 percent of the severely disabled population over the life course. This is likely due to a number of factors, including, including increased vulnerability, a reliance on paid and volunteer caretakers, and in some cases, residents in an institutional setting. Risks are generally highest for people with cognitive disabilities or dementia, who may have a difficult time processing or understanding what is happening to them, may have communication difficulties, and may be less likely to be believed if they speak out. Another crime that has become a significant focus of public attention over the last few decades is child sexual abuse, or CSA. For a long time, child sexual abuse was something people rarely discussed in public. Some of the credit for bringing this issue into the public discourse probably goes to Oprah Winfrey, 
who publicly disclosed that she herself had suffered from child sexual abuse on one of her shows in the 1990s. Approximately 1 in 5 girls and 1 in 20 boys will be victims of child sexual abuse. Peak risk occurs between the ages of 12 and 17, but 34% of victims are younger than 9 years old. Child sexual abuse includes a range of crimes from rape or sexual assault, such as fondling, to non-contact offenses like exposing yourself to a child or possession of child pornography, as well as statutory offenses, sex with a minor who has not yet gained the legal age of consent. Of all crimes, rape is one with the lowest rates of disclosure, meaning rape victims are the least likely of all crime victims to report their assault or victimization or to seek help for it. As with rape, only a minority of victims of child sexual abuse will ever disclose their abuse to authorities, between 30 and 38 percent. Of reported sexual assaults, only about 29 percent result in arrest, according to a study conducted by Snyder in 2000. Prosecuting child sexual abuse is often complicated due to delayed outcry, meaning victims who do disclose will often wait some period of time to do so. Of victims who did disclose their abuse to an authority figure, for example, about 73% did not do so for at least a year, and 45% waited at least five years. Males are less likely to disclose than females, in part due to societal homophobia in cases where the victimizer was also a man, and in cases where the victimizer was a woman, probably because of socialization where boys are taught to think that they should be proud of any sexual activity, no matter how young they were when it happened, or how unwanted or upsetting it co that contact might have been. The majority of perpetrators of child sexual abuse are male, although women are the abusers in about 14% of male victim cases and about 6% of female victim cases. Approximately 23% of perpetrators are juveniles themselves. These include cases where, say, a young teenager has touched or inappropriately fondled or had contact with a younger child. Only about 14% of CSA cases involve a perpetrator who is unknown to the victim. As with other kinds of crimes, you are more likely to be victimized by someone you know. In 30% of cases, the perpetrator was someone who was a member of the victim's family. Unfortunately, there's no one pattern of behavior that is a clear indication that a child has suffered from child sexual abuse, although certain things can be symptoms. These may include fearfulness or avoidance, especially of certain people, depression, anxiety, or aggression, school problems, inappropriate sexual behavior, and in older children, suicidality, substance abuse, and self-harm. When children do disclose, they may do so in stages and through a series of hints, with each hint acting like a test to see how the other person will respond. When the child is ready, if he or she thinks the information will be handled well, they might follow with a larger hint. This can be really easy for parents to miss. If a child decides to test the water by saying something like, I don't think I like spending time with Uncle Dan very much, and the parent responds punitively by saying, of course you do. That's not a very nice thing for you to say. Uncle Dan is very sweet to you. The child might feel less comfortable opening up in the future. If her parent responds with something more neutral or supportive, that's okay. Can you tell me why? It will be more likely to leave the door open for her to share more information. Because a child who's experienced CSA may be frightened, ashamed, or worried that he or she has caused the abuse somehow, or will be punished for it if found out, children who do disclose often won't choose a parent at all, but a friend or a sibling, someone they think is less likely to freak out from the information. Unfortunately, as said before, there's no one pattern of behavior that is a clear indicator of CSA, and as many as 40% of child sexual abuse victims will be asymptomatic behaviorally meaning they'll show no real clear behavioral signs of the abuse. About half will show no physical evidence of abuse. In many ways, not much is known about people who are perpetrators of child sexual abuse. Some researchers will talk about a population of individuals whose sexual attraction is aimed primarily at children. We call these pedophiles, or in some cases, hebophiles or ephebophiles. A pedophile is any individual who fantasizes about, is sexually aroused by, 
or experiences sexual urges toward prepubescent children, children under the age of 13, or as a hebophile or a febophile, both terms are used, describes an adult individual with a strong and persistent attraction to, to prepubescent to pubescent minors, children who are above the age of 13 but below the age of 17. Not all child sexual abusers are, meet the clinical definition for conditions like pedophilia or ephebophilia or hebophilia, meaning, in some cases, they're simply impulsive or situational offenders, people whose primary sexual interest is not necessarily directed toward children, but simply target them because they are available or vulnerable. For this reason, law enforcement will often simply use the term child molester, a child molester is any individual who touches a child with the aim of obtaining sexual gratification, provided that the offender is four to five years older than the child. Child molester is a pretty inclusive term, insofar as it can also include the eight-year-old child, for example, who fondles a four-year-old sibling. In this respect, it may be too inclusive, as such contact isn't necessarily a sign that the older child is or will suffer from any kind of lifelong sexual dysfunction. Not all people who commit child molestation meet the clinical definition of pedophilia. Some researchers argue that most probably don't. But people who are pedophiles do tend to be more resistant to treatment than either hebophiles or situational impulsive offenders who still maintain a primary sexual interest in adults. Habitual CSA perpetrators may select victims strategically, often targeting children from single-parent homes, impoverished families, or unstable, violent, or otherwise vulnerable households, simply because these children are less likely to have trusted adults in whom they can confide, and are less likely to be believed if they speak out. Many times, habitual perpetrators will engage in a process called grooming, by which the perpetrator steadily gains access to the victim, desensitizes him or her to sexual contact, and engages in manipulation to ensure his or her compliance. Grooming usually also involves working to gain the trust of the child's caregiver, playing a role in the child's life, and isolating that child from other family members and friends, and finding ways to control the relationship. Because habitual offenders will very often strategically target vulnerable children, children who don't have trusted adults they can turn to for help, one of the best ways you can protect your own children and other children you care about is simply by being involved in their life. Show interest in their life and spend time with them. Get to know their friends, caregivers, and other adults and children in their lives. Teach them how to talk about their bodies, including giving them proper vocabulary terms for genitalia. Discussion of sex and genitalia, the basic facts of life, should start quite young and should convey the idea that these are private things, but not that they are dirty or shameful. Kids, even little kids, should be taught about boundaries and consent, and even the smallest children can be taught the difference between a good touch, like a hug, that makes you feel good, and a bad touch that makes you feel scared or ashamed, as well as the difference between a safe or a good secret, like not letting your mother know that you're throwing her a surprise party until it's her birthday, and an unsafe secret, again, something that makes you feel dirty, bad, afraid, or shameful. Finally, everyone should be familiar with the role of a mandated reporter. A mandated reporter is a person who has the legal responsibility to make a report to law enforcement if abuse of a vulnerable person is observed or suspected. These laws vary by state. In some states, only professionals like teachers, social workers, or doctors are mandated reporters. But in Texas and a lot of other states, these laws have been expanded to include anyone. In Texas, anyone who has cause to believe that a child's, elderly person's, or disabled person's physical or mental health or welfare has been made or may be adversely affected by abuse or neglect has the legal duty to report that to state or local law enforcement. This report should be made immediately. It is not the responsibility of the mandated reporter to investigate a crime or determine whether one has occurred. That is the responsibility of CPS and other law enforcement or social welfare agencies. Failure to report known or suspected abuse is actually a Class A misdemeanor under the Texas Penal Code. This concludes this lecture on family violence.
Thank you for listening.